Hi, I'm Jewel Singer. I'm a journalist, broadcaster and writer and I'm here speaking with Juliana Engberg. Juliana is the Artistic Director of ACCA. Juliana, you say that the arts have always loved Labor, but Labor has had a lot of trouble loving the arts back. What do you mean by that? I think, um, you know, it's a generalisation perhaps, but I think uh, it's true to say that most people involved in, with the arts are interested in uh, the social dimension. They're, they're interested in issues that I think could perhaps generally be described as, you know, um, humanitarian kinds of things. They like issues of, of justice, they like to be involved in contemporary debates, they like uh, things that, that challenge, you know, society and they like to actually use arts as a, as a way of discussing and debating and putting different perspectives on those sorts of things. So I think, um, as I say, it's a generalisation, but I think the mindset of most people working in the arts is um, to, toward the benefit of people, uh, toward a kind of a human scale of things. That means that they're inclined to perhaps like uh, a labour type of mindset, which is perhaps more devoted to concepts of social justice, um, equality, apportioning money to causes that would perhaps be called motherhood causes or things of that sort. So I think, you know, the arts somewhat align themselves with labour, um, not all, of course, but uh, it's also true perhaps that a lot of people think of the arts as being elite, uh, removed from the common person, um, strangely somehow, you know, the domain of, of the rich and the wealthy. And, and so I think the Labor uh, group, you know, in the, in the politics of that, often think, well, they're, they're well off, you know, they, they've actually got a patron group who will look after them. They're, they're for that portion of the community that, you know, we're not so uh, interested in. But I, I think that's wrong and I think in certain ways it's, it's perhaps good to put it that way. It might, might give some um, pause for thought in a sense and it might mean that every, each side of the politics kind of go, oh, is that how we feel about arts and is that how they feel about us and, and work it out. It's always been a bit of an uneasy relationship between politicians, political parties and the arts, um, particularly in times of economic stress. I recall uh, the National Party in Victoria once uh, suggested perhaps we should stop all arts funding in times of drought, like it's a luxury. That's a good idea. <laughs> that would be a bad idea because <laughs> I, I, I imagine that uh, it would be a, a seriously bereft kind of idea because people really need to feel good in times of stress. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, in, in many ways art provides, I think, opportunities for people to have communal gatherings, to feel a part of something. Uh, and, you know, yes, perhaps it won't provide for water. Uh, as such, it may discuss water, perhaps, and that that could be good. But it could take you right away from the de water debate, or it could you take you to some fantastical place that, for a moment, for a little period of time, takes you out of the mundane, takes you to another spot where, in fact, you can relax your body, you can use your brain in a different kind of way, you can enjoy yourself, because you know the arts can be fundamentally enjoyable and they can be diverting to an extent that, uh, you know, you're, you're really not thinking about the things that niggle at you, you know, all of the time. And I think, you know, to remove arts in order to pay for something else that, of course, is fundamentally also important is, is the wrong kind of concept. You know, it, it, it can be seen, I think, as actually highly beneficial to a public, highly beneficial to a group of people who are, you know, um, suffering in other sorts of ways. I think it's also interesting to look at some of the fixed ideas we have about the political parties in, in a sense that the Kennett government in Victoria, Jeff Kennett was very close to the arts and this was not an expected thing. Um, equally, we also can say, well, John Howard seemed spectacularly uninterested in the arts and yet funding for the arts, as you've pointed out, usually does pretty well under Liberal governments, in fact better than under Labor. It, it generally increases um, under the Liberal government and then it tends to plateau. So, uh, I mean, in, in the instance of, say, Kennett, I think Kennett was an excellent arts minister. Mm. Uh, and I think part of the reason he was a good arts minister is that he was obviously quite fond of art and, and he was brilliantly fond of the city of Melbourne and so he saw that as a, as a place in which, you know, art could really, you know, 
be encountered in design, in urban planning and those sorts of things. I think he understood the very foundation of art and the relationship between economics, tourism and so forth. And so, you know, he had a reason to be very interested in the arts uh, and he invested in it strongly. What was good about the Labor government that came in after the Kennett era was that they didn't subside that funding, they, they plateaued it to a certain extent, they didn't dismantle it. That, that actually indicated, I think, quite a sophisticated understanding on the part of uh, the, the Victorian state government. Uh, we, we have fared, I think, better in, in that sense in recent times than perhaps some of the other states in respect of their, their creative programs and things of that sort. But yes, it, I mean, it, it is interesting. I mean, I didn't realise that myself. It was only when I started to look at figures and so forth and it, it, it did strike me as a sort of trend, you know, that the Liberal government does hoist it up and then it, you know, sort of plateaus along for a little while. I think probably one of the most influential arts policies we've had in Australia was Creative Nation. It sure. sort of always stands out. Um, and so we had a Prime Minister with Keating who was openly supportive of the arts, passionate about it. But the main thrust of that policy, if you look at it, was encouraging that Kennett aspect too. Kennett built quite a lot on, on Creative Nation for his own policies, but the aspect of making it an industry, of looking at it being self-sustaining, self bringing in money from the corporate sector and getting it going, and also making arts industries an industry, mm. actually, wasn't it? I, I mean, Keating had a very good sense, again, of that, that matrix that art is a part of, uh, and certainly he was very keen on the creation of a clever nation uh, mm. that, you know, had its sort of um, end game, if you like, in, in terms of creative product, uh, in, in, a, in creating an industry that could be sort of self-sustaining in a certain fashion. And as a result of that, we all went into a period of um, investigating our own status, looking, you know, really carefully at whether or not we were sustainable as, as businesses. Um, and I think we've learnt a lot through that period. I think it actually was a very good uh, thing to encourage the industry to do. You know, we, we need to, in fact, actually be able to um, work in a sustainable fashion and we need to be relevant to uh, groups around us as well. But I suppose I would like to um, rope it back a little bit now. I think we've done a lot of that work that was um, prescribed by the by the um, Keating government and taken on by the Howard government. But well, what we now need to do perhaps is um, reorient it a little bit and say, OK, we are an industry, we can sort of perform in, in certain ways that resemble businesses, etc. but we're not a profit business. We never will be, I think, a profit business. Uh, and so we have to realign the thinking about why, why arts are important, really. How do you reckon arts organisations are coping with the fact that a lot of this um, uh, responsibility for marketing, et cetera, comes down to, to their own little organisation? We see all the arts organisations now with little pocket guides to marketing your business and things like that and getting their little target audience and basically milking them dry <laughs> as much as you can. Yeah. I mean, it's tremendously tough for arts organisations. Mm. I mean, unless you're a mega organisation such as a, a state gallery mm. or something of that kind, I mean, you really work so hard <laughs> to, yeah. to generate an interest in your um, place, to generate, you know, um, people, people who can support you, all of those things, and you spend a great deal of your time doing it. I mean, my institution, the Australian Centre for Contemporary Art, has to raise 53% of its annual turnover. I mean, that's a phenomenal amount of stuff to raise for mm. what is really an organisation run by 8.2 people. That's, you know, really a tough call on such a small group of people. And it's it's also the case that arts organisations are, are not, you know, parts of a franchise. And so you, you're off doing your own little thing, which doesn't accumulate so well. I mean, anyone who's in advertising would know that you have to make a certain spend to, to gain a certain kind of penetration into the marketplace. It's very, very hard for all those small organisations to really accumulate that kind mm. of awareness for their thing. But I think gradually we're feathering that through and we're beginning to understand that certain places will always be directed toward, say, the cognoscenti. And then at the other end of that scale, there'll be places such as ACA, such as the MCA in, in Sydney and places of that sort that can move to the next level of awareness in the public's mind and thus, you know, create a, a, an interesting sort of trickle-down effect to the smaller guys and so forth. I, mean, I think it is a phenomenon that's occurred over the past several years that 
with our accelerated activity and the way we've been able to bring donors and patrons and, and corporate and business interest into our realm, that by, by virtue of their want to go to a sort of next level of danger or their next level of, you know, contact, a lot of those people have drifted off to, you know, some of the smaller spaces like Gertrude Street or things like that. So it, it's actually about understanding, you know, a, a quite complex ecology of the business because we are the one business but we're all sorts of little different kinds of businesses. We all want to maintain our own... Um, credentials for our constituencies as well. And so that makes us a very difficult um, sort of group of people to mass market because each of us see ourselves as, you know, pitching in a, in a particular sort of way. But, you know, I mean, despite it's been a, a somewhat piecemeal event, I, I think that, I like to think anyway, that there has been a general raising of awareness of uh, the visual arts in which I work and in general the contemporary arts, you know, that share ground with dance and theatre and music and all of those kinds of things. And I think there's a there's probably a social reason for that too. A two, it was a two-pronged attack in, in the sense that uh, there's the effort to take the arts mainstream and also to increase that uh, entrepreneurial business aspect of it. Now, both of those things, uh, we might increase support for the arts and the arts awareness. A problem has always been, and a worry has always been, that it will compromise the aesthetic uh, quality sure. of the work. Sure. Do you reckon that concern is justified when you look back since 96? Look, I think it was justified a while back. I think it was unsophisticated a while back when you used to go to a, a, a corporate person and say, can you help us? And they go, what's the quid pro quo? Oh, well, um, I don't think our people will go for that. don't think they'll like that. And so, you know, uh -huh. you, you began to think, oh, OK, this is quite dangerous. If we go to this corporation and we ask them for their support and then they mm. start to... Um, infer certain things about content and things, this is going to take us down a very difficult path. But I think that, in fact, it's actually become much more sophisticated of late. And the other thing that, I, that I'm observing, and it's quite encouraging in a sort of fashion, is I now think that, in particular, private individuals who have, you know, get, uh, accumulated a certain wealth and status in their own professional mm. lives are really looking now for quite emotional engagement. They're also actually, by nature, fairly risk-taking individuals themselves. They're looking for a form of inspiration and they want to get out of their ordinary, you know, commonplace day. So in many ways, you don't have to actually dumb down. You mm. don't have to, you know, modify what you do to make it banal or, um, mm. you know, appease people with it. In fact, quite the opposite. You actually want to be creating things that enliven people's spirits, make them feel as though they're actually encountering a little bit of risk, making them work again. Because one of the things that is very clear to me is that a lot of people want to think again. They really want to use their brains and their hearts again. Mm. And we, we, we find a lot that we talk to people who are very expert at what they do. I mean, they, you know, very high placed legal people, say, or surgeons mm. and, you know, policy makers, whatever, you know, great corporate captains. But they have, you know, really reached a stage in their own lives, in their own professional development where most of what they do, they know. They know mm. how to do it. It's it's not that risky. It's not that adventurous for them anymore. They might sign off a billion dollar deal. Okay, yep, that done tick. They come to an art exhibition or they come to a play or a dance or a music thing and they go, I don't know what's going on. Fantastic. They mm. shouldn't know what's going on because in many ways their their brain is used to working in that way. Is not used to working in that way. So they love the fact that we are actually reigniting all the synaptic kinds of connections for them. They come out feeling light and, and you know, uplifted and, and like air has come into their heads. And people actually talk about that exact experience. I don't know about airheads as a concept, Juliana. <laughs> they feel lighter of, lighter of head. They, yeah. feel, they feel as though... The windows have yeah. been opened. In fact, that's a direct quote from someone who said to me, you know, today I have spent all day talking to lawyers, bankers and so forth. It's been quite interesting, a little bit exhausting. I've come here, I've listened to you, I've talked to the artist. I feel like somebody's opened windows in my head. And I absolutely think that that's true. So it's not about dumbing down. It's, mm. it's about actually coming up, you know. It's about not wavering on what we do, but perhaps it is also about explaining what we do better 
uh, making ourselves mm. available at certain levels of interpretation so that people have got ways of actually accessing what we do. And I think we've improved a lot in that. One aspect of this uh, is that the, the, the concept that the arts can actually improve the way you think and uh, make you think in different ways. Uh, that is a benefit if you sort of tapping into science and all different fields and, and merging these creative thoughts. This is also expressed in, uh, Peter Garrett has expressed it for Labor's arts policy. And education, very important. Uh, they're looking at research and quoting from research, uh, primary, secondary students that are exposed and involved uh, in the arts actually do better in sciences and the maths and, and things like this. So it's good seeing that sort of research uh, considered and, and well, apparently going to be acted upon. I know that the education aspect uh, for young people of the arts is, is also very important to you, isn't it? I, th I think it's fundamental. I mean, one of the things that's happened, you know, over the past 20, 30 years or so is that there's there's been a sort of separation of the arts and sciences, whereas once mm. they were together, uh, and, and together they, they form the basis of innovation, ingenuity, creativity, all of those mm. sorts of things. You know, when a kid is, is you know, sitting at the, at the kitchen table and putting the salt pepper shaker on the pepper shaker and then putting something between that and making a little totem and things, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a kind of sculptural event. Mm. might seem like play, might seem also quite irritating to a, a parent, <laughs> you know, but in fact what they're learning are things like gravity, they're, they're learning about weight and balance, they're learning all sorts of things. Well, they might go off in, into the, you know, fruity nutty direction and become perhaps a sculptor in later life, or they could in fact actually become a brilliant kind of bridge designer or, you know, something like that. Those things are still, you know, cohabiting at that stage in, in someone's creative life. You know, this is this is fun. You know, this is something I'm learning. You know, when kids used to make those mad little kind of um, marble runs under their desks at school and things, you know, they were learning all sorts about velocity and, you know, how to shoot things down and how to make things go around probably turned out to be, you know, aeronautical engineers for all I know, or maybe they're designing, you know, waterways and things of that sort. I think it would be good to see those things come back together again somewhat, arts and science, because I think we need, you know, creative solutions now for the future of mm. society, for the future of the planet and all of those things. And maybe playing is actually quite okay uh, as, a, as a very foundational level into you know, more sort of sophisticated methodologies down the track. Um, so it's, I'm very glad to know that, you know, this might, might start to become part of the conversation in policy development and that the arts might segue and backwards, you know, education might segue into arts and health might segue through arts and all of these kinds of things because we absolutely know now pretty much without a shadow of a doubt because of the kinds of brain research that's been going on for the past decade or so that you know, a, an active mind, an activated mind is going to be a healthier one, a more adaptive one, one that can cure itself even. I mean, it is simply phenomenal what the brain can do. Uh, and, and if we give the brain tools to work with, you know, uh, on a whole level, um, it's just going to be marvellous. I mean, art is great like that because, again, it, it's not a very singular event. If you're watching a dance piece, for mm. instance, you're looking at dancers, but you're also thinking about their movements. You're also encountering the environment in which they're in. You're looking at the costumes. You're probably listening to music. You've got a number of intelligences that are being marshalled to deal with that event. Mm. And it's coming at all different things. And they've, they've done that mapping. They can actually see when you look at dance or is hearing music or you're looking at visual arts that a whole range of synaptic things uh, you know, sent forth, you know, marshalled forth. Go hither and learn and listen and work this out. And that's why art is, is so important because it actually creates brains that are much more agile in a certain fashion. It's what some people call the peak shift experience where you're going through fairly normal levels of apprehension, comprehension, and then thing, something happens, you go, ooh, what was that? And it just, you know, charges the whole thing off.
A lot of people get very excited about the whole uh, digital economy and where the arts fits in with this and encouraging that. And uh, I wonder, though, if, if this is necessarily the best way of introducing children to the arts. They get a lot of exposure to digital yeah. technology and I just wonder if um, they're perhaps going to lose out if they don't have that touching feeling, direct experience of, of creativity. Yeah. I, I, you know, look, the digital will cohabit, I think, with mm. the actual. I mean, obviously, it's going to have to in a certain way. Those clever people in places like Nintendo and stuff are really developing a lot of product now that actually mm. recognises the, the digital...